Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Today is the third session, uh, and this is a really administration focused session. So this is for the teams that are administering the Sony Cube platform itself. So the, the, the core Sony Cube server, and for teams that are administering individual projects and need to configure uh, some of the features that we've spoken about across the last two days. Uh, so this will be quite um, uh, demonstration focused in the sense that I have my own Sony Cube platform that I'll be showing you things like permissions and um, setting up uh, clean, new code periods and the like. Um, it's also your chance to ask any questions about administering the Sony Cube platform. Um, I have one right here. I'm more than happy to show anything that doesn't come up on the, uh, the specific agenda, um, but where you need some more information. So a quick roadmap of where we're going today. Um, we're going to take a, a short view of the Sony Cube architecture um, and uh, then look at, in fact, this is in the wrong order, we'll then look at performance tuning and scaling. So scaling up your Sony Cube instance as more teams come on board and as you get more projects and more lines of code. We'll look at setting up portfolios and applications. Um, these are a key enterprise feature for organizing multiple projects. Um, so it's important to know how to get those set up and how to configure them. Then we'll look at uh, security in particular. So all of the permission structures of Sony Cube, project level permissions and global level permissions so that you're aware of what you can do with those and how you can control who has access to what on Sony Cube. Um, and then there are a bunch of other administration topics. So things like you know, new code periods, um, some of the uh, branching and, and pull request analysis configuration uh, at the project level. Uh, I'd like to, if there's somebody on the call who has access to your Sony Cube platform, I'd like to do a walkthrough of your platform. Um, I noted particularly when I was talking with the team when we were setting up this training session, um, that your quality gates were quite complicated. So I'd like to take a look at those and see if we can't um, help you simplify them. Uh, then towards the end of today, I have a brief section on our roadmap. Um, okay, thank you, Prashanth. Uh, Suas, if you, could, if you could get ready uh, sometime after the break to, to present your Sony Cube platform, that would be fantastic. Um, I've got a brief section on our roadmap for the nine series that we're working on at the moment. Um, and a section on working with our support team. And then towards the end, just a couple of links on how to keep up to date with what we're doing at Sonosource. Uh, so let's get started. You saw a version of this diagram yesterday when I explained how the Sonicube scanners work uh, and how they uh, run the language analysis on the scanner hosts or the CICD hosts and then push that back to the Sonicube server. What I wanted to explain in a bit more detail today is what goes on on the server side. What are these three boxes sitting inside this Sonicube host and how does this all hang together? Just to give you a sense of what happens a little bit behind the scenes. So a Sony Cube server is made up of three main components. Um, at the top on the right-hand side of the diagram, there's a web server, and it essentially does what any web server will do. It's an embedded version of Tomcat, in fact. It serves up the Sony Cube user interface. On the bottom right of that uh, box is what we call the search server. And this is an embedded version of Elasticsearch. And its job is to index some key information out of the Sony Cube database so that the user interface can run really quickly and smoothly. So all of the filtering of things like rules and issues uh, is done by pulling data out of the Elastic Search indexes rather than dipping into the database with a database query. Um, and that just makes sure that the user interface is really snappy and that all of those um, uh, all of those filtering mechanisms work really well inside the UI. And then the final key component on the bottom left of the diagram is called the compute engine. And if you remember back to yesterday's diagram, I mentioned that after the analysis is done, there's some backend processing that happens on the Sonicube server side to calculate some final metrics, calculate the quality gate, do any pull request and decoration. That's the job of the compute engine. So what happens when the scanner pushes a report to the Sony Cube server is that that report is dropped onto an internal queue. It's, it's a queue inside the database. 
And then the compute engine pulls those analysis reports off the queue one at a time and performs that final processing. And this means that um, that, that post-processing is done on the server side before the final results are available to you in Sonicube. And of course, the final step of the compute engine is to push all of the information into the database. So it's then available inside the user interface. So we'll explore particularly the compute engine uh, in a couple of minutes when we talk about scaling, because this is a key aspect of scaling your Sonicube instance as it grows. The compute engine is in fact, um, I, I mentioned a second ago that it pulls uh, reports off the queue one at a time. In fact, it can pull them off in Sony Cube Enterprise Edition, it can pull them off in parallel. So the compute engine can process multiple analysis reports in parallel in Sony Cube Enterprise Edition. And this is important when you start scaling. So as you bring teams on board to your Sony Cube platform, they're going to want the information about their project to get to them as soon as possible. If you have many teams working on many projects and sending lots of, for example, pull request analyses to Sonicube, in a single threaded environment, those pull request analyses will queue up and it's basically first in, first out. Uh, and so the, the teams that get their analysis reports to Sonicube first will get the results first and the rest will be queued. But it's possible to add what we call workers to the compute engine. And this is actually configurable inside the Sony Cube UI. Uh, you can have up to 10. Normally, you won't need that many. Normally, uh, for a medium sized instance of Sony Cube, two or maybe three compute engine workers is plenty to keep up with a full workload of um, main branch analyses and pull request analyses. Um, but you can go up to 10. If you decide to go past two or three, um, I really suggest talking with our support team. Uh, they can guide you through the process of scaling, uh, particularly memory uh, and also CPU and database processing capacity. Um, and I'll talk about CPU in just a second. Um, I'm not sure whether you've already configured this. Does anyone who knows the Sony Cube platform uh, know whether you've already configured multiple compute engine workers on your side? No, let me, um, let me point out where the configuration is and then I want to talk about uh, memory in particular. Um, if you go to the global administration menu and projects background tasks, here's where as a global administrator, you see all of the background tasks that have completed on your instance. And we'll go through these a little later today. But in the top right corner, here's where you configure compute engine workers uh, and the default uh, when you start up a Sony Cube instance is one, but you can see here you can scale this to 10. And it's basically a vertical scaling mechanism for your Sony Cube instance. Now, the important thing to recognize here is that all of these compute engine workers work within the memory limit of the compute engine. Let me explain in a bit more detail. Each of these three processes runs in its own Java virtual machine, its own JVM. And when you start a JVM, you give it a memory limit as to how much memory it can consume. Um, and if the process just tries to push across that limit, um, it will crash with an out of memory error, uh, which you generally don't want to have happen in real life in your production server. Now, all of the compute engine workers, whether you have one or 10, operate within that overall memory limit. So when you scale the compute engine workers, Sony Cube can't scale the memory for the, the compute engine in parallel. It's because it's configured as part of the JVM configuration. So when you do decide to scale your compute engine workers from one up to say two or three, you need to make some configuration changes in the Sony Cube config file to also scale the memory. Otherwise, particularly if you have big projects and you get two large analyses at once that hit the compute engine and two threads try to process those in parallel, 
um, it's possible that you'll actually run the computer engine out of memory, which is not a good idea. So when you decide to scale your compute engine workers, before you do that, you need to go to your sona.properties file and scale the, um, the compute engine memory. And let me just grab one to show you. Okay, here's the sona.properties file for one of my own internal uh, Sony Cube instances. And if I go to the compute engine, you can see here's the compute engine section. The default memory for a Sony Cube Enterprise Edition instance is two gigabytes, which is fine for processing one reasonably sized project in uh, at, at once. If you need to to uh, say move to three compute engine workers, you need to uncomment this line and multiply the amount of memory by the number of workers. So if I'm moving to three workers, I should allocate six gigabytes of memory for my compute engine. Now that's a, a still a, a quite conservative number. We're making sure there's plenty of overhead here, um, but the rule of thumb is multiply your two gigabytes by your number of compute engine workers. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about that particular piece of scaling? No questions. Uh, yeah, okay. like, uh, yeah, take care. So it's like you are taking two, right? It is, it, is, it is constant, but it may or may not need a same virtual memory, right? It's depending upon type of workload that you are, uh, the process which is running, right? Um, it, it depends on how many threads you have running in parallel in the compute engine. So if you're running, you're, if you're running three threads, you need six gigabytes of RAM allocated. Yeah, but those threads, you know, again, they are doing their own tasks. So they might have their own need, right? So it might be uh, more than that. Each, each, so all threads, all three threads operate within the six gigabytes. Um, so yeah. if one if one thread happens to need three and the others mm -hmm. only need one, you're still fine. Mm -hmm. And the th so, the need for the thread only exists for as long as it's processing the background task. Then it re uh, it gives the memory back. But they are not sharing the memory, right? I mean, it is they like, they are sharing the memory. They are They're sharing, sharing the six gigabytes. Yes. Okay. And is there is any reports which are available around that which can give us some idea, like what? type of memory allocation which is required uh, when we are running or or basically for a capacity planning okay uh, from, um, from solar yeah, we, we don't have any built-in uh, monitoring tools but there are uh, heaps of either open source or commercial monitoring tools you're probably using them internally in other um, applications already so anything that can monitor the memory consumption of a JVM um, can give you, you know, real-time reporting and graphs on memory usage. We don't have any specific recommendations, but you should certainly um, add a monitoring tool to your enterprise instance. That two gigabyte base allocation is um, based on our experience working with enterprise customers. Uh, so it's a fairly safe starting point and then you monitor from there. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, what is the compatible Java version we can use? Uh, does it support Java 11 and above? In the uh, Good, good question, Suresh. Um, the server and the scanners for Sony Cube 8.9 and above must run on Java 11. We don't support anything above Java 11 yet. Our teams are currently looking at supporting Java 17, which is the next LTS. But for now, um, run the server and the scanners on Java 11. Okay, thanks. No problem. Okay, well, let's move on to um, a more 
kind of user interface based, uh, less text file um, configuration. And let's start talking about portfolios and applications. Uh, so I gave a brief introduction to these on Monday, but just to recap, uh, an application is a small kind of flat uh, structure way of grouping projects together that are related at a technical level. So it's generally used by technical leads or architects to look at a group of projects like a group of microservices that are related to each other. And uh, these are an internal construct of Sonicube. They're configured only in the Sonicube user interface. They don't have any relationship to anything outside Sonicube like uh, 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 a repo. Um, they're aggregates of Sonicube projects. And portfolios are a more structured way of grouping together projects, usually for management reporting. So you can put portfolios into a hierarchy, you can have them as deep as you need, you can have them as wide as you need, and you can mix projects and sub portfolios and applications within a portfolio structure. So what I want to demo now is the mechanisms for setting up an application, and then the mechanisms for setting up portfolios, which are slightly more uh, complicated. Um, and more powerful um, because the, the structures are more complex with portfolios. Um, so let's start with applications because they're the easiest. Uh, if you go as a global administrator, uh, now let, let's start here. If you have permission to create an application as a user, on the projects page, you'll find this button in the top right hand corner that takes you directly to the create application uh, dialogue. If you're a global administrator, you also have the ability to configure applications through the portfolios homepage in Sonicube 8.9. In Sonicube 9.3, we've taken portfolios out of this global page because they're um, they're not portfolio. Sorry, we've taken applications out of this global page because they're not portfolios. Um, but in 8.9, and I think you're running 8.9 in production, is that right? Anyone? Okay, let me continue anyway. If somebody could check which version you're running in production in the background, that would be great. Um, and just drop it into the chat. In Sonicube 8.9, you can create an application from the portfolio's global configuration. And to do that, you click on create and simply change the radio checkbox to application. And so now I can give this a name and create an application. The way to add projects to an application is designed to be really simple because these are usually quite small. So you have maybe 10 or 15 projects maximum in an application. And the way to do it is through checkboxing. So if I go to this unselected tab here, I get a list of all of the projects that are on my Sonicube instance and I can select from those in order to build my application. So let's build, I've got a couple of C and C++ projects here. Um, let's add those into this application. When I recalculate the application, I'll now see um, all of these projects grouped together in one uh, place. I mentioned recomputing because it's important to understand that for the first when you first create either a portfolio or an application, it's just a shell for the projects. No overall aggregate metrics are calculated for the application or the portfolio. That happens as a background task. And there are two triggers for that background task. One is either that one of the projects themselves is reanalyzed, or the second is that you force a recomputation. Are oh, you running 9.2? Thank you very much, Lexman. Um, so you're still at the point uh, where poor, uh, applications can be created from this interface. I think it disappears in 9.3. Um, when you, uh, you can force as a global administrator, a recomputation of all applications and all portfolios. This means that you populate this empty portfolio uh, when, um, when you've created it. So what I'm gonna do is force that recomputation now 
This will create my application, my learning made application, and it will be recalculated in the background. Um, so that's applications. They're designed to be really simple checkbox selection, um, flat structures. Uh, portfolios, which I'll come to next, are a little more complicated, but let's see our application. Uh, it will be in the projects page and I can filter for it. Here it is. I've got my, um, my three projects gathered together. They have their own quality gate and new code and overall code as we saw on Monday. Before I move on to portfolios, I want to introduce one small topic uh, on projects, which is project tags. And I need to introduce them now because I'm about to use them when I talk about portfolios. Um, when we were talking about rules on Monday, I mentioned that all of our rules have a set of tags that associate the rule with um, a particular CWE or a particular um, OWASP category, or even a, a category like um, uh, clumsy coding or, or, or complexity. Um, it's also possible in Sonicube to add tags to individual projects. So if you have, for example, a set of top 10 projects that your management team tracks and wants to view in detail, you can add a top 10 tag to each of those projects. And then you'll see in the next section when we talk about portfolios, I can use that tag to group those projects into a portfolio so that the management team can get an overall set of metrics for them. So what I'm gonna do now is tag a couple of projects here um, with the top 10 tag, um, and then we'll use that in the next section when I build a portfolio. So I'm gonna grab my uh, Sonalint for Eclipse. I'm gonna take away that RS top 10 tag and add a Learning Mate top 10. I'm going to take the, uh, where are we? The Java analyzer and do the same. And you'll have to imagine that I've added uh, this tag to another eight projects to make 10. Um, but for now, let's just use two of the top 10. And you'll see in a minute when we come to portfolios that these project tags make a really easy way to structure portfolios. Um, you need to be a project administrator to add and modify the tags. Um, so just be aware that um, they're there and they're useful for what comes in the next section. So the next section is all about creating some portfolios. And what I want to do is create a small self-contained portfolio structure. Um, it's a hint at what you can do with portfolios because these structures can be as large and as deep as you need. Um, but for the purpose of having a reasonably short demo, I'm going to create four sub portfolios and then one super portfolio that sits across the top of them. The reason I want four sub portfolios is that there are four ways of adding projects into portfolios. So I'm going to demonstrate each of those in, in a new portfolio. So let me go ahead and create, um, I'm just gonna, for now, I'm just gonna call them team one, team two, team three, team four. In your portfolio structure, you'll obviously have much more meaningful names for these. And they can be team-based, they can be geography-based, they, they, there's infinite flexibility in how you name and structure your portfolios. So I'll go ahead and create uh, team one, team two, team three and team four. And I'll also create a top level portfolio that I'll use in a moment to pull all of this together into a portfolio structure. So team one, uh, when you create an empty portfolio, the way to bring projects into it is to change the project selection mode here. Um, and you change that from none to one of the th four non-deprecated um, mechanisms. Um, the easiest and simplest, and it looks very much like what we had a second ago for applications, is to use manual mode. And this gets you the same check checkbox mechanism that says, 
hey, I'd like to bring in um, all of the checked items into this portfolio. Uh, so let me gather some interesting projects here. Maybe I'll take some of these example projects. Um, eight or so of those. And that's all I need to do. That's already put those projects into the portfolio. When I force a recalculation later on, CERNCube will then calculate all of the aggregate metrics in this, um, in this portfolio. For the second portfolio, um, I'm going to use project tags. So this is the portfolio that will gather together all of the top 10 projects that I just tagged, which means we should have two projects in this portfolio when I calculate it. Um, and it's as simple as adding a tag. In fact, you can add multiple tags if you need to, and multiple projects um, can be pulled into the portfolio by tag. So I should now have eight projects in team one, two projects in team two, and for team three, we need to talk about regular expressions. This is the most powerful, but also the most tricky way of structuring portfolios. Um, so you can ask Sonicube to find project names or project keys that match a regular expression. And these are real um, regular expressions. So they're, uh, so, um, Certain characters have special meanings like a full stop or an asterisk. Uh, there are plenty of regex checkers now available on the net uh, that help you check your regular expression to make sure that it will uh, do what you think it will do. One corollary to using this or being able to use this um, consistently is it's nice to have your project keys structured. So the project key is the unique identifier for each project um, that is passed to the Sonicube scanner and it's used to key the project into the database. Tools like Maven, for example, um, use a mechanism like, uh, let me just type an example here, com.learningmate.department1 oh, um, department one dot project A. So this kind of backwards uh, domain name style, this is actually a really nice way to structure your project keys if you can uh, keep your teams using something like this, because it means I can construct a regular expression that pulls into my portfolio all of department one's projects without caring which projects they are, just by creating a regex that picks up on anything called com.learningmake.department1. Um, so if you have the chance as you're scaling up your Sonicube instance to force your teams to use a, uh, um, a key structure like this, it's a really good idea when you come to start building portfolios. Um, for now, for this example, um, I have analyzed on my local platform um, the Bitcoin uh, source code. And I know that the name of that project ends in Bitcoin. So I'm going to create a regular expression which says, pull into this portfolio any project name or key that ends with the word Bitcoin. So this dot star means any number of any character followed by Bitcoin. Uh, so team three is going to be Bitcoin millionaires and team four, um, the final mechanism is a kind of a cleanup. Um, particularly useful when you're constructing large portfolios because it gathers any projects that are not somewhere else in the portfolio structure. Um, so if you've created a big portfolio structure and you think you've got everything in the right place, um, but you're not sure, you can create one of these off to the side and it will kind of uh, vacuum up all of the uh, leftover projects and you can then decide where they need to be dispositioned. Uh, so for our purposes, I'll just create one of these for, for a quick demo. So I've now got four portfolios, or in fact, they'll, what they'll be is sub portfolios, but I want to stitch them together into a structure. So what I'm going to do is add them to this top level portfolio as sub portfolios. And the way to do that is to simply select add portfolio. Now, there are two ways to build 
a portfolio structure. What I'm doing now is building it bottom up by building all the sub portfolios and then I'm about to add them into the top level portfolio. You can, if you want to also build this top down um, by using this standard mechanism of adding a portfolio here. So if I add uh, LM team five here, I can create uh, a portfolio, a sub portfolio below this top level one uh, without cr um, creating it separately like I did with the others. What happens now though, is that this sub portfolio is only accessible by drill down from the top level portfolio. Um, so the top level portfolio becomes visible at the portfolios page and I can only get to team five by drilling down through it. That's not what I wanted to demonstrate. I wanted to have all of these portfolios visible at the top level. Um, but if you have really large portfolio structures, this might be the way you want to do it by creating um, the top level portfolio and then adding portfolios underneath. The way I'm going to do it here is to add by local reference. And this means that I can select any portfolio from the set that I've already created. And obviously I'm going to select all the learning mate ones here and add them in one at a time to this top level portfolio. It takes a couple of seconds. And let me just delete this one that I added earlier. So now I have a top level portfolio with all of my four sub portfolios added underneath. And now when I recompute all of this, uh, what will happen in the background is that SonyQ groups together all the projects that I've allocated and calculates metrics for all of these four sub portfolios, then rolls all of those metrics up to the top level portfolio. Um, while that's calculating the background, does anyone have any questions about the mechanisms, the project selection modes that I've been using? No? Okay, well, let's go over and see what we've created. Uh, if I go to the top level portfolio, um, here is my top level portfolio, um, 1.2 million lines of code, and Sony Cube has calculated all of my ratings. We spoke about the, the averaging of the ratings mechanism yesterday. I have my portfolio PDF report if I need it. Um, and you can distribute this to management teams. It has a, a kind of a spider chart of the key ratings a project breakdown within each rating, and then um, history data. Of course, these, this portfolio has just been created, so we don't have any history, um, but normally you will have history data for as much history as you have within the portfolio. Down the bottom of the page, I have my drill down. So here I can start drilling into each of these sub portfolios to see the projects and the overall ratings within the sub portfolios. So team one should have those eight or so example projects that I included. Um, here they are, 5,000 lines of code. And you can see here are all of my example projects added into the portfolio. Uh, team two should have the two projects that were tagged with the Learning Make top 10 tag. Here they are, the Java Analyzer and Cernal Lint for Eclipse projects. Team three will have the Bitcoin project. Here it is selected by regular expression. And team four has everything else. Any portfolio related questions? Okay, so obviously that explanation was super, super clear. Um, great, the next topic that I want to cover um, is probably going to take us about half an hour or so, and it's all about um, permissions. Now, I think you've been working with Sony Cube for a while, 
Um, so maybe this, some of this will be um, already in place or already understood. Um, just give me one second. I'll be back in just a moment. Apologies for that small interruption. Okay, um, let's take a look at platform security. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons we have an entire section dedicated to this, as I mentioned yesterday, every time SonarCube scans a branch, we store a copy of the code in the database. So making sure that your SonarCube instance is as secure as your repos is really important. And so there are a couple of best practices for making sure the platform is secure um, kind of from the outside. And then I want to look at all of the permissions that you have for managing uh, how teams interact with SonarCube and what they can see inside the platform. So let's start with some discussion about securing the platform from the outside. Um, the first thing to do is to make sure that force user authentication is set to true. Um, because SonarCube is an open source uh, product, uh, we have a free open source version called Community Edition. Generally, we have a very kind of open um, philosophy with the Community Edition uh, version. And that means that there's the ability to browse a SonarCube platform anonymously without needing to log in. Now, in an enterprise situation, that's not appropriate. So in fact, we changed the default for user authentication to force it uh, on Enterprise Edition. Um, if you've upgraded from uh, an earlier instance of SonarCube where this wasn't the case, then maybe you've had this set to false in the past. Um, if it is, then I really advise setting it to true because that means that nobody can browse anonymous, anonymously to your SonarCube instance and um, it, it makes everyone authenticate so that they can see anything at all. When somebody does then log into your SonarCube instance, you have two options on project visibility. Projects by default can either be public or private. If they're public, then anyone who's logged into the platform can see all of the project metrics and all of the source code. If you set the visibility of your projects to private, you have some extra control at the permission level over who can see the project and its metrics and who can see the source code. And the mechanism for setting this is, oh, not there, is in global administration under projects management. You can see at the top here, you have the default visibility for new projects. Um, I've set mine to private already. Uh, if yours is not, I really suggest that you do that so that you have the extra level of control in case you have particular teams who are not allowed to see each other's projects. Uh, and I'll show you at the, pro, um, the project permission level in a second, how that manifests itself. Um, Obviously you should be using HTTPS. SonyCube uh, doesn't natively provide HTTPS, so you need to set up a reverse proxy. And finally, if you have non-interactive sessions, particularly for uh, your CI tools, so um, representing a technical user representing Jenkins, or if you're using lots of API calls, um, I really recommend setting up a token for those users. Um, it's done inside the uh, user management system as a global administrator, you can set a token for everybody um, and it stands in place of the username and password. So you don't need to supply or, or keep in clear text anywhere, usernames and passwords and tokens are really easy to revoke and um, cycle if you need to. Um, so particularly for uh, your Jenkins uh, or the user that stands in for your Jenkins system, um, I'd really recommend creating a token and using that if you're not already. 
Um, if you need to, in the Sonicube settings file, it's possible to encrypt uh, particularly sensitive settings. And the ones that you're most likely to need are the JDBC URL and the JDBC username and password. This is what connects Sonicube to your database instance. And some security teams get a bit um, upset in some organizations about any kind of password being clear text on a disk. Um, so if you need to, you can encrypt the username, password, and URL uh, inside the Sonicube uh, configuration file, the, the Sonadots properties file. Um, the process for this is, uh, I think it's a two or three step process. It's fairly well documented. Um, it's creating a secret key that sits on disk and then you encrypt each setting and just drop that into the, into the file. Um, Sonicube has a built-in user database. Um, and for small instances, generally that's fine. You can create a couple of users. If you're a small team of, of five or 10 people um, in a small organization, you generally don't want to go to the hassle of hooking Sonicube into your authentication system. But for an enterprise grade installation of Sonicube, um, it is much, much easier to hook Sonicube into LDAP or SAML um, or uh, indeed your authorization for your DevOps platform. So you manage your users in one place rather than having duplicated users inside the Sonicube platform. And it just adds to the, um, the pain of um, administering users. So generally, and if you haven't done this already, I'd really recommend looking at the documentation and configuring it. Generally, you will hook Sonicube into your central authentication system. Most of those integrations also allow you to pull across group mappings. So you create the blank groups inside Sonicube and then every time a user logs in, Sonicube associates them with the group. And that means you can manage permissions as groups within Sonicube rather than um, individual users. We'll come back to permissions in a second. Um, one option that exists in the Sonicube user interface is for project administrators to have control of the permissions for who sees their project. Now, in some organizations, that's a bit sensitive. You don't want project level administrators being able to add additional users to their projects. And I'm thinking particularly about um, highly regulated industries like banks and, and insurance companies that we often work with. Um, depending on whether this is an issue for you, it's possible at the global administration level under security to define whether project level administrators are allowed to manage permissions on their project. Uh, and if you don't want them to, you simply turn this off and the item disappears completely from the project administration menu. So. Um, depending on the sensitivity of, sensitivity of your organization, um, this is an option that you might want to um, uh, disable. And finally, uh, Sonicube 9.1 and above, so definitely the version that you're running, uh, has a new feature called audit logging. And the idea here is that every security sensitive um, operation that happens on the Sonicube platform itself, things like changing permissions, creating users, modifying quality gates, modifying quality profiles, all of those operations are logged in the database. And you have uh, in the global administration menu, the ability to download those audit logs and then drop them into whichever log monitoring tool you need. Uh, you can also pull them out via the web APIs if you want a kind of a constant integration. And this means that you can tell who did what on your Sonicube platform and when, and backtrack any sensitive operations. So for example, um, if a new user is created and you're not sure why, you can backtrack to who created it. Um, and similarly in uh, code quality and security sensitive uh, parts of Sonicube, if somebody modified a quality gate to take out a condition, um, and that quality gate is applied to multiple projects, you can um, see who did it and ask that user why they were running around modifying quality gates for the entire organization. 
so that's the general principles. Um, what I wanted to do now is dive into both global level permissions and local permissions. Um, I've got a couple of slides, but I actually think I'll, I'll kind of walk through them and give you an understanding of what each one does. And then you can use these slides later if you need to. These are some suggestions on uh, setup schemes for um, particularly for global permissions. But let's take a look at the permissions themselves. Um, what I'll do is I'll grab my 9.3 version. Uh, so that it looks exactly like your 9.2. So Sony Cube has two levels of permissions. There's a set of global permissions that control things like who can do what to quality gates and profiles. And there's a set of project level permissions that are then applied to each project. Um, let's start with global. The first one is uh, really obvious. It basically gives you access to this global administration level um, menu, global level administration menu. Um, and this means that you can do almost anything on your SonicQ platform. It's not quite super user permission. Uh, if a project administrator tries really hard, they can push you out of their project permissions. Um, but generally, it gives you access to anything. And that means um, all of the uh, configuration around licensing, all of the security configuration, um, project background tasks, and so on. The second group of permissions is around administering quality gates and profiles. Uh, and this is global general configuration. So anyone who has this permission can add quality gates and profiles, modify any of the existing ones, delete them. It's, it's global level permission over gates and profiles. One thing to mention around profiles though, is that there's also the ability for a single individual profile to delegate uh, ownership of that profile to somebody. Uh, so if I go to profiles and take uh, this Sonar Way 2, um, if you're already a global user, you can delegate permission uh, for other users to manage just this profile. No others within um, the HTML language or even within the other quality profiles, but just this profile. Um, so this is useful if you have a particular team who is responsible for keeping the profiles up to date and you don't want to take that on at the global admin team level, um, you can delegate ownership of some of those profiles on a per language basis, for example, to a particular team. There is a global permission to execute analysis. Now, this means that if you have this permission and you know the key of a project, you can analyze that project on SonicCube. Generally, when you're deploying SonicCube in an enterprise, you reserve this permission for only the user that's standing in for Jenkins. So you create a, a service account on SonicCube that stands in for your Jenkins user and you provide this global execute analysis permission. Generally, you won't provide it for uh, developers or other users because it means that um, if they make a mistake or uh, have the wrong project key, they can potentially overwrite other teams results and, and kind of mess up their analysis within SonicCube. We'll come to project level permissions. There's a project equivalent of this, um, but generally you'll reserve the global one for the service account that's standing in for Jenkins. And then finally, there's the permission to create projects, applications, and portfolios. And how you use this is really entirely up to you. If you have particular users who you trust to create projects or applications or portfolios, you can delegate that to them. If there's a central admin team that's managing all of the portfolios and applications, you can keep this just for those people. Um, it's designed to be really flexible. So um, what these permissions do is they control uh, this capability here to create a project or to create an application. And on the portfolios page, it opens up this button in the top right corner to create a portfolio. Um, the portfolio management interface I showed before is reserved for global admins because you need to be an admin to get to 
this page here. But the create buttons are essentially controlled by those permissions at the global level. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about those permissions and how they interact? Uh, hi, Cameron. Hi, Nikhil. Yeah, hi. Um, so user management, uh, I mean, uh, who can uh, handle? Suppose admin uh, administrator can create a project application portfolios. So within a project, suppose uh, 100 users are there. So if suppose as a being an administrator, uh, I want to give a permission to look uh, 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 so not projects. So from where I can give that uh, that user management kind of all the activities? For an individual project, that happens in the project permissions. So if you're a project administrator for this project, okay. um, you go to permissions, and we'll cover this next. We'll cover this full set next. Here's where you give them permission to view the project and to view the source code. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, and in a second, I'll talk about. Um, templates to let you set this up more easily as projects are onboarded to Sony Cube as well. Okay. Other questions? Thanks, Kimbra. No problem, Nikhil. No? Okay, Nikhil has given me a lovely segue into talking about project level permissions, so let's do that. Um, the idea with project permissions is that as either a project administrator or um, depending on your sensitivity, a global administrator, I can control some things about the who can do what on my project. Um, and the first thing is exactly what Nikhil was just talking about. Who can see this project in Sony Cube at all? And then within the project, who can see the source code? Um, this is uh, kept separately because sometimes source code is quite sensitive. So you want people to be able to see the project, but not necessarily the code. These two permissions are only available if the project is private. Because if the project is public, then of course everyone can see it. Um, and in fact, if I turn this project public, you can see that those two permissions disappear altogether. Um, so if you want control over this, and generally you will in an enterprise, um, you need to make sure your projects are private, um, and then you have the ability to set these two permissions by user or by group, um, however you need to. <coughs> Excuse me. The next permission, I spoke yesterday when I was talking about the, uh, the issue life cycle about marking things as false positive and marking issues as won't fix and how that can be a little dangerous if you're on the day before the release and everyone is panicking. This is the permission, administer issues, that gives you the ability to do that. So this permission is really for trusted users within each project who understand the implications of marking something as a false positive um, and who, uh, who should have control over how issues are dispositioned within uh, the organization. So um, be a little careful with this permission because it does give whoever has it the ability to essentially close an issue in Sony Cube without necessarily changing the code. The administer security hotspots permission is also kept separate. It's designed for um, senior team members who can look at code in the security hotspot and decide whether it's a security problem for the team or not. Um, so again, this is normally reserved for senior developers or architects who know what they're doing um, and can say that a piece of code in the context of the project is either safe or unsafe. That's why it's a separate permission as well. Uh, the second last one is fairly obvious. It gives you access to this project settings menu. And here you can change just about anything to do with the project. So um, branch and pull request settings, the new code period, changing the quality profile and quality gate that the project adheres to, um, almost anything to do with managing the project. So again, depending how you want to delegate and how many projects you have, um, you'll choose who to give this permission to. And the final permission, I mentioned earlier, it's the execute analysis permission at the project level. 
Um, and again, in small installations of Sony Cube for small teams, it may be that you're happy for team members to execute an analysis of a project from their workstation. So they check out the source code, they run the analysis on the command line to push the results to Sony Cube because they've just um, merged some code into master. Um, they don't have a strong CI um, culture within the team. And so all of the team members do their own analyses. Um, that's fine for small teams in an enterprise grade installation like yours, you're probably going to, as we said earlier, delegate all of that to Jenkins. And so it's, it's not great practice to allocate this execute analysis permission at the project level to anybody. Um, normally you will make sure that Jenkins is the only um, kind of user or pseudo user that can run an analysis. Some teams might have a really good reason for individual team members to want or be able to run an analysis of their project. Um, if that's the case, and if you're comfortable with that, you can provide them with this project level execute analysis permission, which means they can only run an analysis for their project, not for anybody else's. Now, that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, permissions per project that need to be set up appropriately for individuals and groups within the organization. For a small Sony Cube instance, that's not too much of an overhead. For a large Sony Cube instance, that becomes really um, a lot of work for the central admin team. So we've created a templating system that lets you set up templates so that as projects are created, a set of permissions, a baseline set of permissions is applied to that project. So I want to show you how they work um, and give you a couple of hints around using them as well. So in the global administration system uh, menu, you have uh, security permission templates. And here is where you can create templates to that are applied to projects when the project is created. Um, and the way these work is when each project is created, Sony Cube runs through the list of project key regular expressions that are in the templates. And if it finds a match, it applies that template to the project. So you can see here, I have a com.sonosource.anything regular expression. If I scan a project on my platform that has a project key com.sonosource.something, this permission template will be applied. And it basically gives me a permission to do everything and the SOTA administrators group permission to do everything and nobody else. So here's another reason for nicely structuring project keys. Uh, the first one was so that they can be pulled into portfolios uh, by regular expression. The second one is so you can create project template, uh, permission templates that match the project keys. So that when you have uh, com.learningmate.department1 creating a new project, then all of the team members of department one get browse and see source code access, for example. Um, so if you can, uh, again, help your teams to structure their project keys nicely, you get a nice payback in the form of the ability to run templates as projects are created. Um, one a uh, small warning here, templates are only applied to a project when it's created and then the, the association is broken. So if you change the template, the projects that it was associated with when they were created won't change. And if you change the project, the template won't change. Um, so it's applied once at project creation. As an administrator, you can apply a, a template to multiple projects if you want to. So if I grab four projects here, I have the ability to choose them and bulk apply a permission template. But generally, it's only applied once at creation, and then the association between the project and the template is broken. And that's all of the permissions information in Cerner Cube. Does anyone have questions maybe for the project level permissions because I, I didn't uh, give you a chance to ask questions about them.
Heineken. Heineken. Heineken again. No. Oh no, hang on. No, it wasn't. Yeah. So, Hi, uh, yeah. Let's say I have uh, signed up using Google uh, sign up, right? Uh, Google single sign on. So, what is the default role uh, that get assigned to me? It, it will depend. So, if you sign up with single sign on, you will have a user created in the SonicCube database. That user can then have permissions applied however you however you need um, you mean he can get administrator role also yes if you need if you need them to as a global administrator you um so as a global administrator someone has to set a role for that newly signed up user right yes okay the reason we need the users in the database is that uh, issue allocation happens um, by email address. So when I commit a piece of code, SonyCube can only auto assign the code to me if it knows my email address. And so it needs that from the database. Okay. Okay, got it. So my next question is, what is the appropriate role to assign somebody a project let's say there are there's a pro, already a project configured and mm -hmm. i want to assign few users uh, to that project okay yep so what is the appropriate uh, role for that so within the project settings under permissions you have a list of all users and all groups um, and you can choose which of the project level permissions they get so browse and see source code normally for general users, administer issue for kind of power users, senior developers and architects, same for administer security hotspots. Got um, and and you set those up. So who is the one who sets up these roles? Is it only the super admin or uh, any administrator can do that? Let's say I have uh, one role, I don't know. I so 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 super administrators can do it also anyone who has this project level of minister permission can modify the project permissions and add users okay okay that is the answer I would all right yeah thanks perfect other questions Uh, hi, Cameron. Hi, Nikhil. Uh, yeah. Uh, so template, as you said, uh, project permission template. So that, I mean, uh, from where uh, do we have any standard uh, uh, template for that or any format or anything? Uh, uh, the format is up to you. So if I create um, this, for example, um, the the project key here is a regular expression yeah so um for example you need to escape uh full stops mm -hmm. um but i could say anything well let's do team a again or team one so any project key that starts with com.learningmate.team1. anything um, will now be picked up by this permission template. So it's a standard regular expression format. Okay. okay. What is the uh, SCM account ID that is, you know, generated automatically, which is um, different than uh, email address? What is that? Let me ping one of the examples. Ah, okay, you have, um, so the first one is your SCM account ID and the second one is your email, right? Right, yeah. What is this SCM account ID? Um, I'll need to check how those are handled by SonicCube. We have in the user database, um,
the ability to add extra SCM accounts. Um, I'm not sure how those are populated under single sign-on though. I'll need to go back and check. Are you using, you said you were using Google single sign-on, right? Right. Yeah. Um, do you know, are you able to check with each user whether both of these are populated or whether it's only email address in Sony Cube? Both of these are populated. Okay, so Sony Cube should be able to auto assign from either of them then. And I, I suspect what Git will pass is your, uh, your SCM is the first one with the 57060. That's so if they're both populated, Sony Cube will use whichever one it matches. Now the reason I'm asking this is uh, we are using these two values in our uh, one of the applications. And people generally get confused with this, right? Uh, and if you see, there is not, there is no dot in the um, SCM account ID. There are yep. dashes. Okay. And to uh, in the API that uh, through which we are fetching these details, it says assigning. If you, you know, if the drink can in there. So, yeah, the, the assignee for a particular issue is 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 done here. And auto assignment is done by matching either the SCM account ID or the email address, whichever one Git passes to us. I, I guess my question is, are you seeing something that's being invalidly assigned or assigned to the wrong person or not assigned at all? What's the, what's the problem? No, we don't have any problem as such, but uh, in our database, we, have, we are pulling these values, right? And in some of the column, we are assigning uh, this assignee data. Whereas this is not exactly the email address. So we got um, some errors because of, we thought both are same, username and the uh, ACM account ID are same. So we had used a couple of joins using this value and that got um, run into some errors. We have to correct them. That's why I'm, I was asking: Is there any significant difference between them? Um, the, the, from a from an issue auto assignment perspective, there's no significance which one of these is used. Um, but if you're doing reporting on a signee, then maybe you're seeing some issues. It's it's probably something you'll need to create a support ticket for and give the support team a really detailed outline of what's going wrong and where, so they can help you trace um, uh, trace the problem. Okay, all right. Okay, um, that's the end of permissions. Uh, when I send through the, the full set of slide decks, you'll see these, um, these slides as well, which go through a couple of the suggestions that I've made. What I'm going to suggest now is let's take a 10 minute break until 10.30 uh, my time, th uh, three o'clock your time, I think. Um, and then we'll come back to the other administration topics. Uh, and then after that, I'd like to do a platform walkthrough if Suhas can help with that. Uh, so let's, I'll pause the recording uh, and let's break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Okay, welcome back. Um, to finish off the administration section, I want to just touch briefly on uh, a couple of pieces of project level administration. Um, they have some global equivalents, but generally you won't need them. Um, and a quick look at background tasks and branch and pull request analysis. Uh, so the two pieces of configuration that generally projects will do at the project level are configuring a new code period and configuring analysis scope um, exclusions, which we spoke about yesterday. So I just wanted to point out to you where that lives inside the UI 
so that you can then uh, work with your project teams to get that managed. And again, this is project level administration. Um, so if you've delegated administration to project teams, uh, they can do this themselves. So for, uh, what was the first topic? For new code period, uh, it's managed under project settings, new code, and there is a global default. Um, the default default is previous version. You can change that globally inside your instance to a number of days, uh, but that, that's up to you which one's going to be more common at a global level. It's then up to each project team to decide whether they want to use that global default or override for a particular version. Uh, and so when you decide to override for the project, you can choose previous version, a floating number of days, or a reference branch. And then within each project branch, you can also choose if you want to a specific analysis. So this is the starting point for the open forward looking number of days. Um, or you can choose for a specific branch, previous version number of days or reference branch. Um, so it does get where you have many branches, it can get a little complicated to administer. Uh, again, Going back to the comment I made yesterday, if you can use previous version and pass uh, semantic version numbers to Sonicube, it's far and away the easiest thing to do because each of the new code periods resets itself automatically. Um, but if you do need to choose, for example, reference branch or for a particular um, feature branch, then that's relatively straightforward for the project administration team to configure per project and per branch. The second thing that you're likely to want to configure at the project level is project exclusions. So excluding third party code, excluding um, uh, generated code for the project. In small Sonicube instances, you might have some files globally that you want to exclude, but it's unlikely in any decent sized instance that you'll have projects uh, with all of the same exclusion requirements. So generally a project will go to general settings and analysis scope. And this first section is, is about file exclusions. So here you can set your Sona exclusions or your Sona inclusions. Um, the wildcard matching uh, mechanism or, or syntax that I talked about yesterday is given at the top here, just in case you need it. It's not regular expressions. It's a basic wildcard match for file matching. Um, further down this page, there's some more uh, sophisticated or specialized exclusion mechanism if you need them. Uh, you can exclude files from code coverage if necessary or from the duplication calculation. Um, and there are even ways of ignoring um, particular issues on particular files if a project has a really complicated set of um, uh, requirements. Uh, there are, uh, there's documentation for all of this in line. Uh, so you can um, use this if they really have specialized requirements, but generally uh, source file exclusions or inclusions will suit most projects. Okay, so Cameron, uh, just, sorry for the interrupts. No, no, um, Nicole, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so here, suppose if I want to include or exclude, so do I need to add a file uh, file name here or I mean types of file? Uh, what exactly? Because so why can... actually I'm asking, uh, in code coverage, I'm more interested. So where actually I need to uh, exclude my uh, one of my project, test project, okay? So that's what actually I'm asking. Yep, you can... You can include, you can use wildcard matching to do almost anything. Okay. Um, so let's imagine your files are in source test and they're all Python files, for example, yeah. and there's a whole directory hierarchy of them. Mm -hmm. You could say any any set of directories in the source test, uh, it, please exclude all Python files from the coverage calculation. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. So it's designed to be quite flexible. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, Cameron. Did somebody have a follow-up question? I thought I had somebody. Yeah, Milan there. Uh, Milan, uh, hi. Th this can be comma separated, right? If you want the multiple uh, files uh, type to be excluded or the uh, or maybe wildcard 
I wanted to use for other files also, right now it's same. Yes, this is, um, you can have many of these. So if I want source test, um, all of the uh, shell scripts as well, I know it's a bad example, um, all okay. of the JavaScript files, um, you can add as many of these as you need to, to each of these categories. Okay. Okay, I say for example, I have included two uh, folders, right, for code coverage. And then I have mentioned two, two files or maybe, uh, maybe just uh, uh, specific files to be excluded, then those will be excluded, right? Uh, even though those files are there in the inclusion folders. So there, there's no such thing as code coverage inclusions. Okay. Uh, in, inclusions are for everything. And then within that set of inclusions, you can exclude things from coverage, for example. Okay, there's, no, there's nothing like, you know, we can include specifically. Everything is included. For coverage, yes. For coverage, okay. I think, well, no, actually, let me qualify that. By default, um, testing files are not included in the coverage calculation anyway, because right. you can't have coverage on your test files because you'd need extra test files to cover them. So coverage is, coverage, uh, so unit tests are excluded by default from the coverage calculation. Yeah. Any other questions on uh, analysis scope? Hi, Cameron. This is Manish here. Hi, Manish. Uh, Cameron, uh, it was a really uh, good explanation in terms of the excluding any specific files. But is there any way out there to, on our uh, dashboard for the Sonar Cube? We really want to exclude one particular vertical. For example, in my project, I am using, let's say, a different player for uh, code coverage, maybe open cover or something like that. And I have integrated that in my build jobs as well. Now I don't want to have the two different players to run my code coverage, one sonar to one open cover. So is there any way out that I can uh, simply disable the one vertical and sonar cube? Uh, let, let me rephrase so I can be sure I've understood. You have two coverage tools, is that right? Yes. Okay, so you have open cover, for example, and you have, uh... Jacoco. Maybe. Yeah. And you want to display the Jacoco information inside Sony Q, but not open cover? No, no, no. What I'm trying to say is uh, in my build scripts, I have already integrated my open cover. And I now I don't want uh, the Sonar Cube to uh, continue and uh, display my code coverage uh, section out there. So it's in way out. And that is applicable to any other vertical as well, maybe for the code duplication. So is there any way out that I can customize the dashboard for the Sonar Cube to display only the specific verticals I would like to show for a specific project? Okay, okay, now I understand. So you you actually don't want any code coverage information being displayed in Sonar Cube at all because you're managing that in an, in another system. Yes. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it's not possible to customize the project homepage. Okay. Um, we will still display. So if there's no coverage information present, you actually get a, a just a dash here. Um, yeah. So there's there's no information available. Sony Cube will always calculate duplication because that's an internal metric that uh, Sony Cube calculates itself. Um, but you don't need to act on that. So um, if you don't have those conditions in your quality gate, then Sony Cube won't uh, do anything about those metrics. So you can take the, the conditions out of the quality gate. Um, they'll still be displayed on the homepage, but Sony Cube Understood. won't actually do anything with the data. Understood. Understood. Thank you. No problem. Okay, I want to talk briefly about um, background tasks. Uh, for project level and for global level, um, because there are two ways to, to manage background tasks. Now, if you remember back to the uh, diagram we had here, Background task computation is done by the compute engine and it's the finalization of the analysis, pushing the results into the database, calculating the quality gate and doing any PR decoration. And 99.9% .9 of the time that 
uh, process runs in the background successfully, no one even knows it's happening, um, and people, uh, everyone gets their results. Uh, the other 0.1% of the time, it's possible in a couple of cases for a background task to fail. Um, for example, if your license has expired or um, if there's a problem with uh, accessing the database or if you've uh, included a project in a portfolio hierarchy twice, um, there are a couple of situations where a background task can fail. If that happens, the project homepage will display a banner across the top saying, the last background task for this project failed, um, please take a look at the background tasks. And as the project level administrator for that, uh, you have access to the list of background tasks for your project and you can filter them to find the failed ones of which I don't have any. So let me try and find a different project. Uh, let's, I think I have some here. No, that's annoying. Um, you can filter for failed background tasks and let me just grab one globally. Generally, Sony Cube will provide you with some details of what happened. So there's a, under the gear menu on the right, there's a show error details um, uh, menu item, and this will display the Sony Cube error. Usually it's a couple of lines like this that explain really easily what happened. Um, occasionally it will be a stack trace. If it's not immediately obvious what needs to happen, then by all means open a support ticket with our services support team, uh, paste in the, the details that come from this error, if it's a stack trace particularly, uh, and they will help you work out what happened uh, to cause the background task to fail. If you're a global administrator, you have access to the background tasks for the entire platform. Uh, so under administration, projects, background tasks, uh, you can see everything portfolio recomputations, project analyses, and so on. It's all available there. And again, you can filter down to the failed ones if you need to, to take a look at what's going on with um, background tasks across your platform. And finally, in admin topics, um, again, this is a project level configuration, but it's backed by a small amount of global configuration. Uh, which you've probably set up already. Pull request analysis in particular requires Cernicube to talk to Bitbucket because when the background task completes, it pushes the PR information out to Bitbucket via the Bitbucket APIs. And to do that, Cernicube obviously needs to know where your Bitbucket server is and also the pro some project identification information for each project. So as a global admin team, you need to configure under DevOps platform integrations, where your Bitbucket server lives. And you need to provide a personal access token uh, that, so that Sony Cube can push the information to Bitbucket. Then within each project, you need to provide a small amount of other information. If I go to project settings, general settings, uh, where is it? DevOps platform integration. Um, you choose that global Bitbucket configuration and then you provide the project key and the repository slug. So the two pieces of information that they come directly from your, um, from your uh, URL in Bitbucket, um, they need to be both provided at the project level so that Cube for that project knows where to push the pull request decoration information. If you import your project into Cernicube using the project onboarding, um, so under create project, create from Bitbucket, all of that pull request information is set up automatically for you. If you have already got projects that are in Cernicube, you simply need to go in and add the uh, repository slug information into the pro each project. Um, it's a one-time job. Uh, and it sets up everything for PR decoration. Okay, that is basically what I wanted to get through for administration topics.
Um, the next topic is a quick walkthrough of your own Sonicube platform. Uh, so let me stop my screen share and uh, hopefully hand over to Suas. Um, in particular, I wanted to look at the overall number of projects you have and then take a look at the quality gates because they were a bit of a concern to me when we were setting up the, uh, the training session. Um, the quality gate that you have, uh, I think for most of your projects is quite complicated. Um, so Suas, are you on the call? Uh, no, it looks like he's not. Uh, maybe I'll follow up with Prashant separately by email after this, uh, since we don't have Suhas on the call. That's fine. In that case, let me step through to talking about our roadmap and upcoming features. Um, you're already partway into the nine series of Sonicube. Um, you've installed 9.2. We just a couple of weeks ago released Sonicube 9.3. And probably at the end of this year or the start of next year, we will release an LTS version. It's likely to be 9.8 or 9.9. .9, um, that wraps up together all of the new features that we've added across the nine series. About every 18 months, we release this long-term support version and it's supported by our teams until the next LTS. Um, and so you have two options when you uh, set up Sonicube, you can stick with the LTS and then upgrade LTS to LTS, or you can take the path that your team has and upgrade with each new release of Sony Cube that comes out to make sure that you're getting the, the most recent features. So let me take you through some of what's uh, already been delivered and some of what's coming up in Sony Cube 9 series. The big ticket items that were, or the, the big groups of items that we're developing, uh, we're of course improving our security offering with each new release. Uh, we're also focused very strongly in this set of releases on enterprise grade features that I'll detail in a couple of minutes and some updates to operability. I mentioned yesterday our language coverage in the Sonicube 8.9 LTS um, was for injection vulnerabilities around the big six server side languages and buffer overflow vulnerabilities for C and C++. In the nine series, we're taking a really strong uh, stance on mobile apps for Android and iOS uh, across Java, Kotlin, and Swift. And we've built some entirely new uh, analyzers for infrastructure as code. So Terraform, CloudFormation, Ansible, and Kubernetes. Uh, you already have Terraform and CloudFormation. We're developing new rules for those as well. Uh, and Ansible and Kubernetes will come in some future versions. On top of that, again, looking at cloud type, uh, cloud native apps, we have developed some injection vulnerability detection for uh, cloud lambdas for Python and JavaScript. And if not in 9.2 already, then you'll have those in Sony Cube 9.3. Um, and of course, we'll extend the rule sets of each of these out across the nine series as we go. We're also keeping up to date with language evolution. So C Sharp 9 and C Sharp 10, uh, Java 16 and 17, we already have some rules for those. Uh, we're starting work on rules for C++ 20, and we'll extend that to support some safety critical C++ standards across the nine series. Uh, if you have some old RPG code floating around, which many of our financial and insurance customers do, uh, we now support freeform RPG. And we're also starting to develop a, a posture around education. So helping developers understand in more detail uh, particular vulnerabilities, how they can be solved, um, how best to mitigate against them. Uh, and that contextual content uh, around educating development teams will roll out across the nine series later this year. In terms of um, 
enterprise scale deployments of Cernicube, we're making a whole bunch of improvements uh, across our enterprise and data center edition. Uh, you already have in Cernicube 9.2 project PDFs. It's one of the most um, requested features we've ever had, I think. And finally in 9.2, it's made it. Uh, so there's now a PDF that can be exported for each project at the project level. Um, that shows you all of the new code metrics and new code conditions and the quality gate. Uh, also coming is a, um, a more detailed report that's used for um, audit purposes. So a lot of organizations we work with in the financial space need to archive a copy of their code quality and security report with a copy of their code at a particular point in time. So we're developing a new report that will be in 9.4 um, that has that project level um, detailed uh, static reporting. Uh, security audit trails I mentioned earlier, they're already in. Uh, regulatory reports is what I just mentioned, they're coming. We're moving towards the OWASP Top 10 2021 uh, and the ASVS standards for our security reporting. One other feature that you're going to see roll out over the next couple of versions, because it's the subject of quite a lot of work inside Sonosource at the moment, is speeding up analysis. So I mentioned, I think yesterday when I was talking about pull request analysis, currently in Sonicube, when you analyze a pull request, Sonicube analyzes the whole project and then scopes the results down to just the new lines in the pull request. Uh, that's mostly because we don't want to miss any cross-file dependencies. So if changing a file, uh, a line in a PR introduces some problems elsewhere in the project, we don't want to miss that. Um, but there's a trade-off against speed because analyzing the full project, particularly in large projects in an enterprise level, uh, means that uh, you're slowed down to the size of the, the project. So we're looking at incremental analysis. We're looking at analyzing only changed files for pull requests. And depending on the language, this will roll out across the various languages of Sonicube over the coming months. So you can expect to see as you move to new versions of Sonicube that your analyses will speed up, which is good news for everybody. Uh, and finally, we have some plans to introduce uh, some more features around user housekeeping and token housekeeping. At the moment, um, it can be a bit annoying at scale to try and work out uh, when a user leaves, how to revoke their token easily. Um, managing large numbers of users and tokens is a bit annoying inside Sonicube. Uh, so we're going to make some changes there. And we're deepening our integration into DevOps platforms. Uh, we already have uh, support for GitHub Actions and Bitbucket Cloud Pipes have just arrived as well. Uh, and we have demoed internally. I'm not sure that it's in a version yet. I think it will be 9.4. Uh, Sonicube integration into GitHub security scanning. So there's now a separate section inside GitHub that manages security. And we're making sure we've got a really nice tight integration with that security um, uh, component of GitHub. In the operability space, we now have Kubernetes support for all editions, including Sonicube data center edition, which is our um, multi-host uh, environment. We're looking to provide specific guidance and support for particular Kubernetes cloud providers. So whether you're deploying in um, AKS or in Azure or um, particular flavors of Kubernetes, we're looking at what support we can provide to help make those deployments easier and quicker. And we have also released uh, for data center edition, it was already available for enterprise, um, a Helm chart, uh, which was beta in 9.2 and went general release in Sonicube 9.3. We're making some changes to Sona Lint as well. Um, I think I showed the detection, the secret detection rules either Monday or yesterday. Um, a nice way to stop secrets leaking into your code repositories. 
we have quick fix support now across most of the versions of Sona Lint. So for some rules, it's really obvious what needs to change. And so Sona Lint can provide a quick fix that's a one click uh, fix inside your IDE. We're also looking to simplify um, some of the project and module binding uh, that I demonstrated quickly yesterday. We have integrated into JetBrains Rider, which is great news for C Sharp fans, and into C Lion, which is great news for C and C fans. Uh, we're looking at changing the project synchronization mechanism uh, to make it a little more real time so that changes to quality profiles on the Cerner Cube side are reflected more quickly in Cerner Lint. Uh, and also, one of the uh, key problems with Sona Lint in the past has been that it hasn't been branch aware. So if you were working on a branch in Sona Lint and somebody marked a false positive on that branch in Sona Cube, there was no way to get that update across into Sona Lint. Uh, so we're working at the moment on improving how Sona Lint handles branches, which uh, will be again, good news for all Sona Lint users. And there is plenty more to come. Uh, we now have, we've, we've rolled out a new tool at Sonosource in the last uh, 12 months for managing our products and their roadmaps. So we now have uh, via a tool called Product Board, publicly available roadmaps for all of our platforms. So um, the links here are for Sona Lint and Sona Cube. The really nice thing about this is that you can comment on them. Uh, so if there's a feature that's in our roadmap that you feel is particularly critical for your teams, uh, you can, uh, let me click through and I'll show you how it works. Uh, you can say, for example, uh, allowing a new branch to become the main branch. This is critical for us at LearningMate and provide a comment as to why. And this feeds directly into our product management team for all of your use cases and to help them understand how critical these features are. And that helps a little bit with um, prioritizing the roadmap. So please, if you see features in this roadmap, uh, these roadmap pages that are really critical to you, don't hesitate to comment on them. Um, if you want to provide some context privately, um, our uh, support team is also happy to um, for you to open a support ticket and say, hey, we've looked at this new feature um, suggestion. It's important to us for these reasons. They can then internally add a private note for our product management team if you want to keep it um, within the support system. All right, any questions on roadmap? That was a lot of information to cover in a short space of time. No? Okay. Then the final topic for today is a little bit about working with our support team uh, and uh, a couple of best practices. The first slide is actually more about um, how you choose the version of Sony Cube that you're working with. And uh, given that you've already got 9.2 installed, you've, you've kind of made this choice already. Um, you have essentially two tracks when you're using Sony Cube. There's the LTS track, which is where you go from the 8.9 LTS to the 9.8 or 9.9 LTS, which will come out at the end of this year or the start of next year. Or you have the option to take the latest track. So you're currently on 9.2 with an expectation that you will upgrade to 9.3 and 9.4. Um, there's a trade-off here of stability versus new features. So the, the LTS, you can be sure will be stable. And um, as I said, supported for that 18 month timeframe. The latest versions, um, we officially support only the latest, latest. So um, 9.3 is now our officially supported uh, latest version. What that means is for you at 9.2, if you find um, a bug that is in 9.2 and was fixed in 9.3, um, we're not going to release a 9.2 patch. We'll basically say, hey team, upgrade to 9.3 because the fix is there. Um, and it, it just means a, a quicker upgrade cycle for you. 
Um, so just be aware that with the latest track, um, we expect you, not on the same day that we release it, obviously, but we expect you to periodically update your SonarCube instance to the latest version. Um, our support team handles via Jira Service Desk uh, your support issues. Um, there is uh, a really strong team that sits behind this. And I wanted to just point out that it's not quite what you might have seen from other vendors. There's no um, level one, level two, level three support within Sonosource. All of the people who handle all of the tickets are real experts in Sonicube and Sonalint as products. And um, there's no kind of script-based analysis of your first request that then gets escalated to a level two person who knows a bit more. You go straight to an expert. Um, that has a couple of implications. Um, it means that your problems are dealt with uh, quickly without needing to escalate. It also means that it's for more than just, please help us, it's broken. Um, so our support team is super happy to get reports of false positives or false negatives from our analyzers. They're happy to give advice on best practices like I have as part of this training. They're also happy to receive suggestions on new rules where you see that maybe one of our analyzers is lacking a rule that will be important for you and for others in your industry. Um, we're more than happy to receive those rule suggestions. We evaluate them in the support team, pass them on to our development teams as appropriate, and eventually they, they find their way into the product. So please, of course, they're there to help you when things are broken, um, but the, the team is also there to help with, with other issues as well. So please don't hesitate to open a support ticket when you uh, want help or, or have some suggestions to make to us. When you do open those tickets, um, for the best experience both for us and for you, um, please keep one issue per ticket. It's, um, it's really easy to kind of gather together two or three issues that all seem to be happening in parallel and push them into one ticket. Um, but generally that, that causes problems on our side. We can't distribute the load as evenly across the team and it can be do it's it makes it difficult to focus on one problem at a time so please where you have one issue file one ticket when you open each ticket um, if you haven't supplied it the first thing we will ask for is what's called your support information file it's a json file that's downloaded from your sonicube server by the admin team it's a snapshot of your sonicube instance at that point in time so it tells us um, what plugins you have installed, uh, what integration points you have, uh, lines of code for particular languages. It's a summary snapshot of your SonaCube instance, memory settings, uh, how many compute engine workers and so on. Um, it's essentially a mandatory piece of information for each ticket, even though it seems it might not be relevant. Um, so please supply it upfront. Um, you can save yourself one trip around the cycle of, of emails backwards and forwards. Uh, by simply giving it to us up front. And the other thing that we can't have too much of in support tickets is log files. So if you're seeing a problem with the scanners, please grab the full text log file out of Jenkins and uh, attach it to the ticket. If there's a server side problem, the easiest thing to do is zip up the logs, file, the logs directory from your SonaCube instance and attach that to the ticket. Um, it's almost impossible to give us too many logs. And the more you give us up front, along with the explanation of the problem, um, the, the quicker we can get into proper analysis. So please um, give us as many logs as you can up front. Uh, when you do that, I specifically mentioned text files. Um, please don't, <laughs> I've seen in the past uh, some, uh, some teams who have pasted a text uh, log file into a Word document and then PDF'd it. Um, that's really not useful for us on our side. Please don't. Um, we, can, we can search text files. We can't easily search Word documents and PDFs. So please use portable file formats where you can. Plain text is super useful. Um, PNG or JPEG or GIF or something for uh, screenshots if you need to send them. Um, keep it portable, please. I mentioned on day one, our community forum. 
it's a really great place to go for information to see if somebody's had a similar problem to you um, to find out more you please feel free to post there and, and share your experience with Sony Cube and help other users. But if you're posting a support ticket to us in the commercial support team, um, please don't also cross post to the community. Um, it, it kind of doubles our effort. And on a personal note, um, I've, I've handled support tickets in the past. It's really nice to know who the person on the other end of the ticket is. So please just drop your name at the bottom. You'll notice that all of our team signs their tickets um, and it's much nicer to have a conversation rather than to be addressing some generic learning mate person whose name you don't know. So please feel free to have a conversation with the team um, by dropping your name onto the ticket. They're all super friendly people. And finally, a couple of links on uh, keeping in touch with what we're going, what, what we're doing and what's going on in our, our product. Um, our JIRA instance, which tracks all of our uh, features and bug tickets is open to the world as part of being an open source company. So you can find almost anything you need to on JIRA. Probably more usefully in terms of understanding our roadmap, uh, these are the links to the product board uh, roadmap cards that you can look at and comment on. We have a website that contains all of our rules for all languages that is uh, up to date with the most recent release of all of our rules. So if you're a version behind in Sony Cube, for example, and you want to check which new rules have been added to Terraform, uh, you can go to that site. Uh, the community I've mentioned a couple of times, we have a couple of Twitter accounts and also a blog. Um, particularly interesting if you're interested in security topics. Uh, we have a security research team that has found several uh, vulnerabilities in open source products and they published some really interesting blog posts on how they found them, how they were exploitable, um, some really kind of low level nitty gritty information about um, exploitable vulnerabilities. So if you have any interest in security, drop across to blog.sonosource.com and you'll find some really interesting articles. And that is all from me for this uh, this set of training sessions. Um, we still have 20 minutes in today's session and I'm more than happy to stay and answer any general questions. Um, I'll also send through our uh, feedback form. As I mentioned yesterday, I would love to get your feedback so we can try and improve our uh, presentation and our training. But let me open the floor to any question on any of the topics we've covered. The floor is yours. Uh, so Cameron, along with yours, I'll send my feedback form as well. So hey Cameron Melindia, uh, this might uh, this is already covered, but just wanted to know. Uh, how to configure multiple branches and the PR uh, in Sonar? Sure, Milan. Yeah, so no can, can we have those documentation, maybe any differences? Um, you're using Jenkins and Bitbucket, uh, and I'm assuming you're using the Jenkins multi-branch plugin for Bitbucket. Um, so it's actually quite straightforward to have all of your branches scanned. I don't think there's any special documentation for it. Okay. Um, it's simply a matter of uh, setting up the branch discovery mechanism in Jenkins okay. to, to allow the multi-branch plugin to discover your branches. That information is then passed automatically to the Sony Cube scanner. Okay. And PRs are the same. Okay. Let me just quickly check. Uh, Bitbucket, you're using Bitbucket server, yeah, I Yeah, Bitbucket assume. server and uh, Jenkins jobs. Yeah. Uh, tick, tick, tick. Uh, it may actually be under the Jenkins... Here we go. 
okay, so the Bitbucket branch source plugin mm -hmm. uh, is available here. And then configuring multi-branch pipeline jobs. Um, yeah, let me, let me drop this reference into the chat. Um, this will work. help you, yeah, this should help you configure your jobs in Jenkins. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, then I will stop the recording here.